its value because it alleviates suffering within us and with each other. There is a, a, a dedication of merit that you might hear after the end of a, a Tibetan retreat or teaching. It says, by this ethical behavior, may we swiftly realize the great perfection and uplift each and everyone without exception. Everyone without exception exception. And ethical behavior does this because it, it draws our behavior toward ahimsa, non-harm. And sila or precept practice, it informs us, it helps develop and sensitize our understanding of ahimsa. Precept practice is on the cushion and off the cushion. We walk the walk as best we can. And as we study and practice these precepts, they start to sink in. We start to express them in our behavior. And when we don't, we notice it and course correct. These precepts help us to hold good boundaries. And when we're able to hold good boundaries, we are protecting ourselves and others. Each precept is an invitation to reflect on what is right and to nurture a reverence for all living things. And it's not only engaging in non-harm, but engaging with kindness and metta. Lori talked about this Monday. And Buddha said to his beloved Ananda, when I'm gone, allow these precepts to be your teachers, not not as a person, but as an understanding from within of what ahimsa feels like, embodied, live from them, live by them, walk the walk. We have these portable teachers, they support us in walking the walk. And the third precept helps us to align with respect and care and dignity of these bodies. Aware of the suffering caused by sexual misconduct, I vow to cultivate responsibility and learn ways to protect the safety and integrity of individuals, couples, families, and society. And Thich Nhat Hanh said, if you want to learn how to love yourself, take a breath and remember you have a body. In Buddhist tradition, he says, we Speak of oneness of the body and mind. Whatever happens in the body happens in the mind. The sanity of the body is the sanity of the mind. And the violation of the body is a violation of the mind. For me, and maybe it's true for you too. The precept practice really can point to the edges that are challenging, where maybe we need a little more kindness, maybe a little more generosity, 
Maybe, maybe we need to be a little more honest here. Maybe a little more strength or discipline. Okay, so sort of inquiries. And all of this, all of this through the lens of mindfulness, which is defined as a non-self-referential, non-judgmental posture of caring attention, looking at ourselves as if through the lens of a beneficial presence. In precept practice, we can come face to face with, with our wounds, with our shadows, the rougher energies, our hurts and scars. And when these wounds haven't been metabolized, we can continue to suffer. We experience them in the bodies. And we can cause additional harm out of this suffering that hasn't been metabolized to ourselves and to each other. We may use different strategies to find comfort and security. And some are skillful. Often they're not. So when we cause harm, minor or significant, it can be so subtle in ourselves and in the world, but we're not ethical within ourselves. And this is not malicious. This is, this is because we haven't yet grown our resolve to act in accordance with sila. Maybe we haven't had enough support. Maybe we're not even aware of this. I want to share a story with you. A few years ago, I was sitting in, in my office with a woman who had a history of sexual trauma and abuse. And she frequently shares of feeling unclean. And shame pervaded her sense of self colored the lens through which she saw herself and saw the world. It was difficult for her to receive care or kindness. She would often mock it. And she was someone who came to me for a while and then would leave and, and, and go out somewhere else and then come back. And I worked with her when she was 150 pounds overweight. And then she lost the 150 pounds. And she gained it back. And when she came back to see me, she had entered a, um, the 12-step program of OA. Some of you may know it. it it's modeled on the 12-step of AA. And Food uh, in this program, food is measured and weighed and portioned, and there's a time to eat and there's a time not to eat. There are certain foods you can eat and certain foods you cannot eat. You really hear the holding environment, the structure around food. And she had made a daily commitment to uphold these structure, this structure. And one day she was running late and she came into my office with the measured uh, yogurt and cereal and, and fruit. And uh, she said, yeah, this, was, this was actually breakfast and I need to eat it before, I don't know, two o'clock or something, or then I can't eat this meal. And can I eat here? And I said, sure. And so she started to unpack her food and was eating quickly and talking at the same time. I don't know, what I'm sure a lot of us do that, eat and, and talk. And I just invited her. I said, you know what, let this, let this be your meal. You don't need to slow down. 
Slow down. Let, let, let yourself enjoy your meal. And so she did. Each bite. Crunch. Chew. Swallow. Spoon back down to the bowl. Maybe some of you have been on retreat. People may be like that very mindfully, slowly. And when she started to come to the end of her meal, tears came down her cheek. Audio is quite can people hear me okay? Okay. Okay. Tears came down her her uh -uh, cheeks. And she packed her food. And then she started to sob. And she started to run. 40, 40 percent. And she said, Jay, this was a gentle meal. I've been violent with food. And she saw. And then This this afternoon or this experience was was a glimpse of how something like eating, which we which of course we need it 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 nurtures us. We can't survive without it. But it had become well. You know, it was a source, probably initially of comfort of soothing, became something that was harmful. And a way that she was using it hurt her. She was unable to, to steward her wants and hungers, unable to feel satisfied. Does that sound familiar? Love and nourishment and safety and respect have really been absent for her. So each person is an invitation to reflect on what is right and what nurtures a reverence for all living things. It is not only engaging in non-harm, but engaging with kindness and Meta, a gentle meal, a healing touch. So, asking each of us what what supports this in us, and what hinders this in us. And we want that be really just a heartfelt inquiry. Thank you for listening. And now we have this wonderful opportunity to practice. <laughs>